So we hope you're all enjoying the uh, conference. We got the uh, after lunch crowd, which is impressive. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a challenge to stay awake after having a good meal, but we'll, we'll try to work through that. So yeah, just honored uh, to be here. Uh, you know, we're in the home stretch uh, of the conference. And so uh, there's a topic we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's going to be from uh, Psalm 2. And uh, I think this is going to be fitting and fit well with where we're at in this conference because this is uh, going to be talking about how in, in the end, uh, God wins and Jesus wins. Uh, we've noted in this conference these last few days that uh, there's many ways in which the world rejects God and his ways and rejects Jesus. We often see today wickedness often prevails. Uh, this can be discouraging uh, for the person who knows uh, God in Christ. Oftentimes we see in our world today that life is not honored and respected. Uh, there's marriage confusion. Uh, there's gender confusion. Oftentimes good is called evil and evil is called good. But the good news for us is that this uh, situation will not always prevail. So the way things are now is not always how they are going to be. And thus, I, I do think it is an appropriate title as we look at Psalm 2 as our base text to understand that justice will reign. Now let's, as, as we get into Psalm 2, I just wanted to make a couple of comments that the Christian and biblical worldview affirms objective truth and objective realities. Now, it's not a popular thing to say in our postmodern society, but we do believe in objective truth. We believe in things that are real. Uh, we believe that there is right and wrong, and then, sorry for the redundancy, but there is real reality. And this truth and reality, they stem from God and his nature, and secondly, they also stem from creation and creation realities. Now, when God made us in his image as human beings, we're supposed to love God by obeying him and loving what is true and right, understanding that what is true and right stems from who he is and how he intended for things to be. Now, on the other side, hating God involves disobeying him and embracing what is contrary to his nature and to creation realities. So we see that a lot today, and that's partly why we have an ethics conference, not only to talk about what is right, but to address things in our society and culture uh, that, are, that are not right. And so oftentimes in our world, we do see the disobeying of the creator. We see people disobeying God, which involves doing the opposite of what he commands, just like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Uh, there is also idolatry, where there is the worship of things and persons other than God. And then obviously there's, there's atheism, where people will at least say uh, that they don't believe in God, they don't believe in a creator. So there's a lot of rejecting God and who he is uh, in the world. And there's also rebellion against creation realities that we're, we're seeing. And I think that's always been true, but I think in, in the last decade or two, we've seen a rejection of creation reality stemming from Genesis 1 to 2 in a way that the world has never seen before, at least on a, on a global scale. Uh, for example, the marriage of one man and one woman, that is a creation reality that stems from Genesis 1 and 2. But in our world, we often see adultery, we often see fornication, uh, uh, same-sex marriage, those sorts of things that are contrary uh, to God's purposes. Uh, we have, in the last few years in particular, seen more gender confusion than we've ever seen before. Stuff that other generations may have been shocked to see that we were even talking about these things today. Um, there's uh, disobeying God when it comes to the creation reality of the family, which is also a Genesis 1 and 2 reality that's linked with the confusion when it comes to male and female. There's confusion when it comes to the roles uh, of men and women. We would even say that there's confusion when it comes to the role of parents and children. And there's also hatred of the nuclear family. For example, that's a big part of Marxism, is to try to take apart uh, the traditional uh, nuclear family. We also see attacks on man's role as God's image bearer to rule the earth and its creatures. That, in a sense, is one of the very first things stated to man in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, to fill the earth and also to rule it and its creatures and to subdue the earth. 
But oftentimes today, the creation will made, be made equal to or more important than those who are made in the image of God. Uh, on the other side, there can be abuse of creation. So I just point all those things out to say that uh, definitely there was a lot of rebellion and a lot of sin. Not only takes place on an individual, but take, often takes place on a national level uh, and oftentimes with uh, many nations. So we know experientially, and we also know from Scripture, that ever since the fall of man in Genesis 3, that there has been a war that has been raging. Not only are individuals who do not know the Lord at war with him, but nations are at war with God and against what is right and against creation realities. And one of the things we see from Scripture and from Psalm 2 is that all sin is ultimately directed at God and his Messiah. So the war that we are a part of, which is a spiritual war too, involves the nations on earth against the God of the Bible, and as we'll see in Psalm 2, against his Messiah, the one we now know as Jesus. And this battle is the subject of Psalm 2. Now when we come to Psalm 2, we want to set the scene a little bit. The author of the psalm is David. We know that from Acts chapter 4, I think around verse 25. We're explicitly told Psalm 2 is a psalm of David. The participants in this psalm are the nations on earth, their leaders, then the God of the Bible, and then the Messiah, who we now know as Jesus, who currently are in heaven. What is at stake with Psalm 2? The battle of who will reign supreme on earth. That's what's at stake now, we might also want to note briefly that there are a lot of psalms. You know, we know there's 150 psalms, but it's been pointed out by uh, many that psalms 1 and 2 are very foundational to the rest of the psalms. So in one sense, the psalms that come after Psalm 2 are largely building upon the themes that were established in Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Now, Psalm 1 talks about the blessed man as opposed to, to the wicked. And then Psalm 2 talks about the fact that even though the nations are raging against the God of the Bible, that God is going to establish his son and king, the one we know as Jesus, he is going to establish him to reign upon the earth over the nations with a kingdom of justice and righteousness. And that's a message that we definitely need to hear and def definitely need to be aware of. I also think that when we come to Psalm 2, there is a sense in which with intertextual connections all the way back to Genesis 1, we think of that original mandate given to Adam who represents man in verses 26 and 28 for man to rule the earth and its creatures and to subdue it. So I do think what we are talking about today relates back even to Genesis 1. Now we know Adam is going to fail in his mission to rule and subdue the earth as God intended. All of us after him will fail as well. But Jesus ends up being the ultimate man, the last Adam, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Not only does he bring atonement for sin and salvation from sin, but he is also destined to reign upon every square inch of planet Earth and everybody and every nation that is on planet Earth. So that is significant as we come to Psalm 2. Now, when we come to Psalm 2, there are four scenes that develop. There's four scenes that we need to note. Uh, interestingly, each one of these four scenes has three verses. So it makes it a little bit easy to, uh, to grasp. The first scene is found in verses 1 to 3, where you have the nations rebelling against God and the Messiah. So you get the scene where the nations are upset against uh, God and the Messiah we know as Jesus. That's the first three verses. Verses 4 to 6 are going to discuss God's response to the rebellion. So the nations are going to be in a rage, and then God has something to say about that. Scene 3 is going to be found in verses 7 to 9, where the God of the Bible declares the Messiah's coming reign on the earth. The nations are going to be speaking foolishness and things that are sinful, but there's going to be a decree <laughs> that is stated from God concerning the Messiah about reality, about what is really real and true. And then scene four, there's going to be a choice that is given, which, which is worship or perish. And even though we're going to see that God is angry with the sinful nations, there is also 
the possibility for mercy before it is too late, before the day of the Lord, before Messiah's kingdom is established on the earth, that those who are currently in rebellion, whether as an individual or as a nation, there is the opportunity to repent, but that has to be taken advantage of because there is a day of wrath that is coming. So let's go ahead and look at verses 1 to 3. This is scene 1. Scene 1, the nations in rebellion. Now we're told in verse 1, why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. And that's, that's Yahweh, that's God. And against his anointed, which is the Messiah we now know as Jesus. So this is against the Lord and against his anointed. And what are they saying? Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So with this setting for the rebellion, the thing that we're seeing here with verse 1 is the nations and the peoples of the earth, which is basically referring to the Gentile nations and people groups, as a whole are in a state of rage and of plotting foolishness. When it talks about this rage, it's almost like a, a, a loud rage. <laughs> There's a sense in which they are very upset and it's, it's almost even audible. So they're in a state of rage and notice when it talks about that they're also plotting in vain, because that indicates that what they're doing is foolishness. So when we look at this verse 1, we're seeing amongst the nations and the people groups of the world a state of sinful agitation. And we could say that the nations are up to no good. I think of Charles Spurgeon, who when quoting, uh, in dealing with Psalm 2, he made the statement, where there is much rage there is generally some folly, and in this case, there is an excess of it. And that's what we are seeing here. Rage can make people unwise, foolish, act irrationally, and we see that they are upset against the God of the Bible and his Messiah. Now, in verse 2, we're going to see that the leaders of the people groups are also addressed. So not only the nations and peoples as a whole, but verse 2 talks about the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. So you end up having here the kings of the earth and then the rulers. So now you actually get into the leaders. So uh, like people, like leaders in this particular case. And so the leaders are also up to no good. When we see that they are setting themselves against God, this indicates that this is not just a momentary fit of anger, but this is a deep-seated hate and it is intentional. We could even say that it is deliberate. When we see that the rulers are taking counsel together, this means that they are united in their opposition against God. Now, nations and national, nation groups oftentimes, are, they fight each other, they're in battles, they don't like each other for various reasons. But when it comes to being opposed to God, they have unification with that. Uh, they, they come together uh, on that. So they come together, they are planning evil. Oftentimes throughout history, there's more names that we can list. Individuals like the Pharaoh of Moses' day, Antiochus, Epiphanes, you get into some of the Roman emperors, Caligula, Nero, Diocletian. Even more re recently, we think of wicked leaders such as Hitler and Stalin. And we know that there also is a coming Antichrist, the beast of Revelation 13, the man of lawlessness of 2 Thessalonians 2, the world has been full of leaders that are opposed to God and his Messiah. Now, what are these leaders saying? What are these nations saying? What's their main problem? What is going on? Why are they so upset? Why are they so agitated? And we see in the last part of verse 2 that it is against the Lord and against his anointed. So it's very personal. It's very personal. Remember, all sin is ultimately directed against the God of the Bible. But here's what they, and then we're going to be told what they are saying. And what, what, are, what, are, what are they saying? That leads us to verse 3, where we're told, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So that's really what it ends up being about, is they don't want to obey God. They don't like God's commandments. They want to be done, they want to be away from what God has to, has to say. If you were to read Romans 1 through most of Romans 3, 
we see that mankind is in rebellion against God. Man wants to act autonomously. What was the problem going on in the Garden of Eden? God had said how things were supposed to be, but Adam and Eve decided, no, we want something more. We, we don't want to obey what God has to say. So when we look at this here, the main issue ends up being is that they view God's ways, they view his commands as oppressive, and they want to act autonomously. There's a lot of things that sin involves, but acting autonomously, which is really saying, I want to be God. I don't want God telling me what to do. I want to de decide for myself uh, what to do. Now, history oftentimes is the story of man waging war against God and Jesus and not wanting to do what they want. We know in John chapter 1, verse 11, concerning Jesus, that he came unto his own, and his own what? Did not receive him. We know in John 3, 19, Jesus told us that people love darkness more than the light. And very interestingly, in Acts 4, around verses 27 to 28, Psalm 2, which was originally used of the Gentile nations, also includes Israel at the time of Christ as uh, he, is, he is being rejected. Now, as we say that, we understand that there is a future salvation and restoration of Israel that is coming. But Jesus was rejected by his people. We're told in Acts 4, 27 to 28, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Even if we look to the future, one of the things that we see in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 and following, which is describing the second coming of Christ, we see the Antichrist and the kings and the nations of the earth literally willing to go, with the, uh, go against and fight against the returning Jesus. I think of Revelation chapter 19, verse 19, where we're told that I saw the beast, who's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. The one sitting on the white horse is a reference to, to Jesus, the returning Jesus. So I think that's been well established in history. It, that's definitely been something that is experiential. It's something that we are told will happen uh, in the future as well. So when it comes to this issue of autonomy, you know, just think of the ways in which the nations and the peoples of the earth often fight against God. Oftentimes we see in our world today that mankind who is apart from God will say, we will determine what is right and wrong. We will determine what marriage is, even if it's contrary to Genesis 1 and 2. We will determine what a human being is and when personhood begins. We will determine what gender is and how many genders there are. We will determine who gets to live and who gets to die. Those are all acts of autonomy. Now, that was scene one. Now we're coming to scene two. And what is scene two about? Scene two is verses four to six. And this is where we see God's stern response to the rebellion. So we have the rebellion, which is stated. This is God's response and the scene now shifts to the glories of heaven. Now the scene takes us up to heaven where you have God the Father and the Messiah who seems to be sitting at the right hand of God. And we're told in verses 4 to 6 that he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Now, when you come to verse 4, we see here that God actually laughs at the rebels. He who sits in the heavens laughs. So we see God pictured in heaven, and we do believe that there is a universal uh, kingdom that reigns from heaven. God is in the heavens. He rules over every square inch of everything that's in the universe. So there is a universal kingdom of God in heaven that reminds us that everything is perfectly under God's control. And we're seeing that this God who sits in the heavens, that he, that he laughs and he holds them in derision. So in other words, what we're seeing here is God is not concerned. Now, sometimes we as human beings, we can become very concerned by the evil and the, sorts of, and the wickedness and the denying of creation realities. 
Sometimes we can become upset. We, we think that this may win, uh, that this will always be the case. But we're seeing with this verse, God knows how irrational this is, how futile it is, and very importantly for us to understand, God is not worried. God is not worried. He's not in heaven saying, whoa, they're very, very strong, and there's so many of them in their opposition to me. Um, what am I going to do? So he is not taken back by the nations. And then after laughing at the rebels, in verse 5, he speaks to them. So God will speak in wrath and fury. That's what verse 5 says. Then he will speak to them, to the nations, in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. And then he's going to end up being, saying something that we're going to see in verse 6. But notice, he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. Which goes to tell us here that this rebellion is not going to go on uh, forever. Now, I personally think that this fury and wrath actually has implications for the coming day of the Lord, which will take place, which is talked about in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 2. We're told it's going to come like a thief in the night. So the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, those are things that bring a very visible expression of the wrath and fury of God. And I noticed here, um, now I, again, I understand we're dealing with Psalm, we're dealing with Hebrew. When you get to the book of Revelation, we're dealing uh, with, with Greek because the New Testament's written in Greek. But in verse 5, there's the mention of what God? There's the mention of his wrath and there's the mention of his fury. When I look at Revelation 19, verse 15, which is actually describing Jesus' second coming to earth, the day of his second coming, we're told that from his mouth comes a sharp sword, which refers to the power of his word, with which to strike down the nations. That seems to relate to Psalm 2, doesn't it? And he, what, will rule them with a rod of iron. So when Jesus comes again, physically, bodily to earth, he's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and then the last part of verse of Revelation 19, 15 says, He will tread the winepress of what? Of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. So you see the parallels with the words there? We see fury and wrath mentioned. That God, This is what God's going to do and unleash upon those who are unrepentant in verse 5. And we see an expression of that at the time of the second coming according to Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. So the wrath of God is a very real thing. This is something that individuals and nations should be very, very concerned about. Now, the end of verse 5 mentioned that God's going to speak saying something. Well, what is that something? We're told in verse 6, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And this is a great statement that God is going to establish his Messiah as ruling king in the realm of the rebellion, which is on earth, which is over the nations. Now, the nations may be raging with their foolishness, and they may be plotting certain things, but this is the statement of how things really are and will be. God is saying that he is going to establish his Messiah on earth to reign as king. I have set my king, who is the Messiah, in this context. Notice it's going to be on Zion, which is in Jerusalem. And it's related to my holy hill. That is a hill in Jerusalem linked with the Temple Mount. So not only is there going to be an earthly kingdom of the Messiah when Jesus comes again, it's going to be in Jerusalem. And here, the psalmist, David, refers to a future event as if it already happened. As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill, which is the words of God. That is a statement that we know will come true with the event described in Revelation 19.15 at the time of Christ's second coming. But it is something that is stated in such a way that it's so real, it can be stated in the present, which indicates certainty and it indicates inevitability. Now, from our standpoint in time, we're still waiting for the second coming of Christ and the restoration of all things, which Acts 3.21 mentions will happen when Jesus comes again. If you have time, sometime read Acts 3, 20, 21. It says when Jesus comes again, there's going to be a restoration of all things. So the kingdom of God will invade the kingdom of man. 
Jesus will set up his kingdom in the realm where the rebellion was occurring, and that is something that is done according to the will of God. I think of Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, which is very deep into the coming tribulation period, very deep into the coming day of the Lord. And there, according to Revelation 11, 15, we're told that there's this seventh angel that blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So there will be a dramatic change that takes place. The wicked nations of the earth, used to getting their way, used to plotting foolishness in a dramatic short period of time, the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So that's going to be the answer. That's going to be the answer to the foolishness of the nations. Now that brings us to scene three, which is the next three verses. This involves verses 7 to 9, and this is the inheritance of the Messiah. So if you look in verse 7, now this is something that the Messiah is stating concerning what God is telling the Messiah. Now we also believe Jesus the Messiah is God. But what we're saying here, there, this, there, this is the Father telling the Son, who in this case we know is the Messiah and Jesus, I will tell of the decree. I like that word decree there. I will tell of the decree. This indicates that this is something that is real. This is something that is fixed. This is something that is going to happen. The nations may have been stating their uh, rebellion and their foolish and wicked words. But there is this real decree uh, that will take place. And what is this de decree? The Lord said to me, says to the Messiah, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. So what you're seeing here is the Messiah speaks of God's declaration that he, the Messiah, is God's son and king. Now, Jesus has always been God's son as the second person of the Trinity. But this is particularly focused on the recognition of Jesus as messianic king, the one who will rule the nations and the earth. So there's that decree that this is going to happen. Now, verse 8 is very important because it actually speaks of what God is granting to the Messiah specifically. And again, it's very important to catch those first few verses of Psalm 2 where the nations are in a rage and they're upset and they're making a lot of noise and they don't want God to rule over them. And what we see in verse 8 is the statement, ask of me, in other words, the Messiah, all you have to do is ask of God, ask of me, and I will make the nations as your heritage. Some translations have inheritance. So I will make the nations as your heritage or inheritance and the very ends of the earth your possession. So not only does God not surrender to the nations, and their leaders, he gives the nations and the earth to the Messiah. So there's two things going on here. Number one, the nations as the inheritance of the Messiah. And number two, all of the earth, every square inch, as his possession. So this describes an earthly kingdom of the Messiah over all the nations, which is exactly what we see in other scripture passages, as in Zechariah 14, we see this in Revelation uh, 19 and 20. We see this in Isaiah chapter 24 and 25. Again, to come back to Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, which talks about the second coming of Christ, we're told that from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. So the nations that are currently in rebellion, Jesus is going to rule over those nations when he comes again. If you were to read Zechariah chapter 14, the early part of the chapter talks about Jerusalem being under siege by the nations of the earth. And then it describes the Messiah coming down and touching on the Mount of Olives. And we're told in Zechariah 14 verse 9 that the Lord will be king over all the earth. This isn't just a spiritual kingdom. There are spiritual requirements and characteristics of Jesus' coming kingdom. But it is an earthly kingdom. 
So the Lord will be king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. You know what that means? There are no false religions at that point. There are no other false religious leaders. There's no false philosophies. When Jesus comes back to planet earth to reign over this earth and to reign over the nations, everybody will physically, visibly see that he is the one and there is no competition for who's in charge. Notice that this return of Jesus that we're talking about is not some hand-holding ceremony in the sky. It's not just uh, souls who are just uh, kind of in the clouds in the air. No, when we're talking about this particular event, we're talking about Jesus coming to reign over the earth. At his first coming, Jesus came as the suffering servant. He came as the, as the, as the blameless, spotless lamb to make atonement. But at his second coming, he's, he's the lion from the tribe of Judah, the fulfillment of Genesis 49, 8 to 12, where you get that language. It's interesting that in the heavenly throne room scene of Revelation 5, Jesus is referred to both as lamb and as lion. According to Revelation 5, 9, he's the one who purchased with his blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. That's that lamb aspect. But then in Revelation 5:10. Those whom he has made to be a kingdom, those who are his followers, they will reign upon the earth. So the lion and the lamb. Now when we come to verse 9, we see this continued uh, even further. One of, we see here that when the Messiah comes to reign over the nations and over the earth, which we do mean quite literally, we're told in verse 9 that you, the Messiah, shall break them the rebellious nations and peoples, with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. So the language of that is very strong. Break them with a rod of iron. Shatter them like earthenware. When I hear this sort of language, it reminds me of this section that I've already mentioned a couple times, I believe. Genesis 49, verses 8 to 12, and particular verse 10 of Genesis 49, where it was predicted that this individual called Shiloh, or he to whom it belongs, which is a specific reference to the Messiah we now know as Jesus, that he would rule the peoples with a strong scepter. So the sort of thing that we're seeing in Psalm 2 is not only connected with Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it's connected with Genesis 49, 10. What does Genesis 49, 10 say? The scepter which has reference to warrior and kingly implications, kind of a, warrior, a warrior's club and a kingly staff. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So this king is going to come from the line of Judah. Nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and then I like this last part, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So to him shall be the obedience of the people. So even way back in Genesis, chapter 49, it was predicted that this Messiah, this he to whom it belongs, this Shiloh, would rule the nations of the earth. This is a strong military victory. The Messiah will defeat opposition on the earth. We've already mentioned Revelation 19, 15 a couple times where he will rule them with a rod of iron. One verse, or I should say a couple verses we have not mentioned at this point, is Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 to 27. And, and before I quote this, I just want to note that in Revelation 19, 15, we're told that Jesus is going to come again to earth to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And in Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 to 27, Jesus says that for those who are in him, and this is actually a message to the church in Revelation 2, they will also rule the nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 2, 26 to 27 states that this is what Jesus says. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. Now you might read that and say, well, wait a minute, Jesus. I thought you were the one who was going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And that is true. But we're dealing with the both hand here. So for those who are in Jesus, you don't get to do this just on your own strength, <laughs> but if you're in him, you're a believer, you're in him, Jesus says, you know what was promised me in Psalm 2.9? I'm going to let you share in that. So when Jesus reigns, those who are the overcoming church, they get to rule the nations with a rod of iron. But we only get to do it because we're in him. 
In Matthew 25, verses 31 to 32, Jesus said, in connection with the second coming to earth, that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. That's the promised Davidic throne of which the Old Testament talked about much, a throne in Jerusalem where the Messiah reigns on earth over the nations, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd uh, separates the sheep from the goats. So that's talking about a coming reign of the Messiah. Now, we still have three verses to uh, mention here, but I think what we've seen so far is a pretty devastating victory that is discussed in Psalm 2, where uh, God does not forever take the wickedness and the rebellion of the nations. He will establish his king to reign upon the earth from Zion, from Jerusalem, on the holy hill. He will break opposition. That's pretty strong. That's pretty tough language. Now, when you get to the fourth scene, there is a choice that is given, though. It is a choice. We call this worship or death. Worship or death. And this is found in verses 10 to 12. Now, what I wanted to say here is, or wanted to say here is that the language has been pretty tough coming from God towards the rebellious nations, but there, but there is also the opportunity, although for a limited time, for mercy. So even in the midst of wrath, there's the opportunity for nations to come to their senses. Now, according to Scripture, that's not going to go on indefinitely. <laughs> it's not going to go on indefinitely, and we don't know when the day of the Lord is going to break forth. But there is mercy that is offered. That's what we're getting at here is there is mercy for those that will lay down their rebellion, lay down their autonomy, whether as a nation or as an individual. So we're told in verse 10, Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. And don't let it slip your notice that early in the psalm, we saw the kings and the rulers mentioned, didn't we? So the kings and the rulers were mentioned as those who were in sinful, rebellious opposition to God and his Messiah. Now what we're seeing here is, king, O kings, be wise. So there's a call for wisdom. <laughs> and then also, be warned, O rulers of the earth. So there's, there's, there's the call for wisdom, and then there's a warning. And what does that involve? Basically, it involves getting on, involved on the right side of history. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you'll hear that about uh, whether someone or some nation is on the right side of history. This is the ultimate <laughs> being on the right or the wrong side of history. The, uh, the ultimate thing is where do you stand uh, with the God of the Bible, with his Messiah? Where do you stand? For those who come to him, they're on the right side of history. <laughs> For those who are not on his side, they're on the wrong side of history. So notice what they're called on to do in verse 11. According to verse 11, serve the Lord with fear. Stop the autonomy, stop the rebellion, serve him. Notice rejoice with trembling. Verse 12 mentions, kiss the sun. Some translations have, do homage to the sun. There's a lot of discussion that has gone on regarding that particular statement, but it does appear to be to indicate that this sun, this king, this Messiah uh, is deity. That's the sort of homage and stuff we see that is due to God. So kiss the sun, do homage to the sun. Why? Lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Those are the sorts of things we've seen with all those passages that we've looked at. Genesis 49.10, what we've seen in Psalm 2, uh, verses uh, 7 to 9, Revelation 19.15, all these. That Jesus did come as a lamb at his first coming. He will always be lamb. But there's also that lion aspect as far as ruling king. So kiss the son, do homage to the son, lest he be angry and what you perish in the way. For notice what his wrath is quickly kindled. That does not mean at the time of this writing that the wrath of God was going to be poured out within the next 10 seconds, but it does mean that that is overhanging humanity. Um, the imminence of this can take place at any time. And then notice the, the last part, we don't want to miss this, the very last statement of the psalm, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And we don't want to miss that. That's true for nations, but it's also true of an individual. There is anybody who's on the wrong side of history. You have not trusted in Christ. You're in rebellion against him. There is the call for mercy. And there's blessedness for those who take refuge in him. That's part of the beauties of the gospel. You can have your sins forgiven. And you can be in union with, with Christ and with God and experience 
uh, the blessings of that. So the nations are called to, what, to be wise, uh, to be warned, because they're not always going to get their way, that there is going to be a coming day of wrath and fury. Now, what does this mean as we look at this? So I, I just have a few points of application that I want to mention here. And this is, you know, as we think about what this means on a practical sense, and I, do, I do want to say, number one, the rage of nations is to be expected. That doesn't mean we like it and we want righteousness to prevail, even now when we celebrate when it is. But don't be surprised when the nations do not act as they should. Point number two of application, understand that God will deal with this situation. He currently is in control of everything that's taking place in the universe. And there's also a plan for his son to be installed as king on the earth. So God has a plan. He is going to deal with this situation. Point number three, we want to offer mercy to the rebellious. Even though we know that wrath is coming, we plead with people to trust in Christ, to find forgiveness in him. That's what we want. But point four, we do know that wrath is coming and we have to live in light of that. There's two truths. There is forgiveness for those who seek refuge in the Messiah, in the one we now know as Jesus. But there is also a day of wrath that is coming upon the world. And then just last is, is a question that we just ask for ourselves. Of course, we've talked a lot about the nations who are in rebellion. But just ask yourselves, are you on the right side of history? It's one thing to talk about as nations, which is true. But as you as an individual, are you on the right side of history? Are you in rebellion against God and his Messiah? Do you chafe against their ways? Do you view the commands of the Lord as burdensome and things that have to be cast off? Or have you kissed the Son? Have you done homage to the Son? Do you serve him and in doing so find yourself on the right side of history? So I think as we read Psalm 2, we have to understand it personally, experientially for ourselves. We also understand this has implications for nations and our nation as we work to do what is right, to pray for what is right. But we see here that with this Psalm 2, that God is in control and he wins. There is a, uh, a line from, this is my father's world, which I think of when I think of Psalm 2, and it is this. The song, there's a line in the song that says, this is my father's world, oh let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let the heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Psalm 2, and we thank you for this strong message that our world needs to hear. We live in a world that is often in rebellion against you. It is defiant and we as individuals without you are also rebellious and defiant. So I just pray all of us have come to be on the right side of history, to trust in Jesus, to find forgiveness in him, that we avoid the wrath that is to come. We pray for our country, we pray for the nations, that they would listen to the message of Psalm 2, and that they too would kiss the sun before the wrath and fury come, and before it is too late. In Jesus' name, amen.